السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في قرآنه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقضى ربك أن لا تعبده إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما أف فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما واخفض لهما جناح الذل من الرحمة وقل رب ارحمهما كما رب ياهنه صغيرا We commence by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى who is no doubt our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. We ask him the Almighty to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Tiyam. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I would like to start off today's talk by asking you all a question. And I want a show of hands, inshallah ta'ala. And even the brothers and sisters who are streaming in from Facebook, they can show their hands as well using the emoji. They can either use a thumbs up or a waving smiley or even the hands up emoji, inshallah. The question is, either this morning or yesterday, how many, now the thing is, I want you all to be honest with me, inshallah, yeah? You have to speak the truth, okay? We are in the month of Ramadan, all right? Okay. So either this morning or yesterday, how many of you all made dua for your grandparents? Hands up, please. Grandparents. Mashallah. For your grandparents. Okay, I'm sure there must be a lot of brothers and sisters online as well. So grandparents, Okay. Now I'm going to ask you an even more embarrassing question. How many of you all, either this morning or yesterday, made dua for your own parents? Parents. Okay, mashallah. Okay, mashallah, mashallah. May Allah bless you all. So half of you, roughly, raised your hands. I'm not trying to blame the ones who did not make dua, okay? Nor am I trying to find fault with the ones who did not make dua. I'm just trying to prove a reality. And that is the reality of life. The reality of life. When I asked you all about your grandparents, there were only a few hands that came up. And for us, most of us, our grandparents are still fresh in our memories. Great grandparents, Wallahu alam, Allah knows best, some of us might not even know their names. Great grandparents. Some of us might not even know their names. Great great grandparents, we don't know anything about them. But grandparents, we do know them. And they most probably might have been alive when we were born, when we were children. Parents, obviously. But the thing is, the reality that I'm trying to highlight here is that as time passes, generation after generation, we sadly tend to forget about the generation before us. We tend to forget our, about our parents. We tend to forget about our grandparents. The generations that sacrificed so much and did so much for us to be where we are. I am standing here, obviously with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the barakah of Allah azza wa jal, and also due to what my father and mother contributed and sacrificed. You are seated here, perhaps you are a doctor, perhaps you are an engineer, perhaps you are a businessman, perhaps you're doing good, you're living a comfortable life, and we are all living comfortable lives, alhamdulillah. We fight our own battles, yes, we are all suffering deep within and we have our own battles that we cover up with beautiful smiles and we go on, yes. But still, wherever you are, 
It is because of your parents. It is because of your parents and because of the sacrifice that they put in. Let me tell you all a story. And I, I actually narrated the story the other day on Facebook, but I'll repeat it again, inshallah. There was a little boy, there was a little boy who lived close to an apple tree. There was an apple tree by his house. And he had the habit of frequenting this apple tree because he was small. He used to go by the apple tree, he used to play by the apple tree, he used to run around the apple tree. It was a beautiful apple tree with a lot of apples. So whenever he felt hungry, he would pluck a juicy apple from the apple tree and he would consume of it. Whenever he felt tired, he would lie down by the shade of the apple tree and fall asleep. Whenever he felt like playing, he would climb the tree, climb up the branches of the tree. He would spend a lot of time with the apple tree. Now what happens? Time passes by and the little boy now starts to grow up. And now he becomes busy with his toys. And in today's modern day context, it would be with his PS4, with his Xbox, with his Nintendo, with his uh, PS4 handheld, with his iPhone. Now he's busy with his toys. He doesn't have time to go and play with the apple tree. Now one day he's passing by the apple tree and the apple tree in a very excited tone calls out to the boy. Little boy, little boy, how I miss you. You used to come and play by me all the time, but now you don't spend any time with me anymore. Why is it? The boy looks at the apple tree and says, well, you know what? I've grown up now. I have grown up now and I play only with toys. And I'm sick of my toys. I want to buy some new toys. I need money to buy new toys. Do you have any money with you? The tree thinks for a while and says, well, I don't have any money with me. But I have a lot of apples with me. If you wish, pluck all of my apples and go to the marketplace and sell them for some money. The boy thinks about it. Good idea. He plucks all the apples. He goes to the marketplace and he sells it for a tidy sum. And he buys himself some new toys. Time passes by now. And the boy now grows up to become a young man. And now he is looking to get married, mashallah. Now before getting married, he wants to secure a good house for himself. So he's looking to secure a good house. And one day he passes by the tree. The tree immediately calls out. Young man, I remember you as a little boy. You used to come and play by me. But now you never ever come and visit me. The young man looks at the tree and says, Well, now I'm a young man. I'm going to get married, inshallah, very soon. And I'm looking to build myself a nice house. I'm looking to build myself a nice house. Is there any way that you can help me out in this regard? The tree thinks for a while and says, Well, I don't have money. I don't have any apples because you plucked all my apples. But I do have strong and sturdy branches. I do have strong and sturdy branches. If you wish, you can chop off my branches and build yourself a nice house. The boy thinks about it. Good idea. He grabs his axe, chops off all the branches and he builds himself a nice sturdy house. Time passes now and the boy is now about to retire. Life passes by inevitably, you understand? Now he's going to retire. And he feels like he's been living a, a life full of stress and he wants to relax, he wants to indulge in his hobbies. So he's thinking about it and he thinks about sailing, he's always wanted to go sailing. So now this time he passes by the tree, the tree again calls out, young man, I remember you as a small boy, you used to come and play by me, but now you never visit me. The man says, well now I'm going to retire and I'm looking to purchase a boat to go sailing, I want to visit a few countries. The tree thinks for a while and says, well, I don't have any apples, I don't have any branches, but I do have my trunk. If you wish, take my trunk and carve a boat for yourself and go sailing. The boy thinks about it, good idea. He grabs his axe, chops off the trunk, carves himself a boat and he goes sailing. He travels to many countries and now he returns after a long period of time. He's an old man. His hair is all white. He's hobbling now. And he makes his way by the tree. He's shivering. He's so old and frail now. The tree looks at the old man and calls out, Little boy. Because the tree remembers the old man as a little boy. So the tree calls out, Old man, I remember you as a little boy. You used to come and play by me. But now you never ever visit me. The old man says, 
will be I'm very old now. I'm old and frail. And now I don't want anything other than rest. I just want to rest. I just want to sleep. The tree thinks for a while and says, while I don't have apples, I don't have branches, I don't have a trunk anymore, but I do have roots. And I can gather all my roots for you to sleep on my roots. And the tree gathers all its roots and makes like a bed for the man. And the man comes and sleeps by the roots. Lo and behold, it was the decree of God that he should pass away. And he dies by the roots and he was buried by the roots. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this is a story with a moral to it. This is our relationship with our parents. The apple tree, our parents, our mothers and our fathers. They do whatever it takes to keep us happy. They give all that they have to keep us happy. Just like the apple tree gave its apples, gave its branches, gave its trunk and finally even gave its roots. It destroyed itself for the happiness of that little boy. Our parents do whatever it takes. At times we don't know. When we are young, we don't know of the difficulties our parents went through or are going through at that period of time. They struggle, they find it so hard, but they do whatever it takes to help us study, to help us live a comfortable life, to give us a good upbringing, to keep us in a good environment, and they bring us up. They bring us up. They literally annihilate themselves trying to keep us happy. But as good children, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we have to always remember our parents. And the ayah in focus is the ayah that I recited at the beginning, which is in Surah Bani Israel, ayah number 23 and 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, wa ta'ala, your Lord has decreed not to worship Allah ta'budu illa iya that you're not supposed to worship any other God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He is the only God worthy of worship and He has decreed that you treat your parents with ihsan with excellence upon excellence and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to state وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ if one of them attains old age or if both of them attain old age by you, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ Don't even say uff or any other words similar to that. Perhaps your mother or your father wants you to do something. Perhaps they want you to run an errand. Perhaps they want you to do something for them. Do not disregard them. Perhaps you have gone to them to ask them for some advice. And they perhaps are advising you in contrary to what you want to do. Don't say uff. Or don't disregard them. Do not repel them. But speak to them in kind, caring, and noble words. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, And lower unto them, وَخْفِضْ لَهُمَا Unto your mother and your father, جَنَاحَ الدُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ Your wings of humility and mercy. Your wings of humility and mercy. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is striking an example as to how a bird lowers its wings. If you notice at times birds, when they fight with one another, they flap their wings. They flap their wings in a boisterous way. But on the other hand, if a bird is calm and if it wants to surrender, what does it do? It spreads its wings out and it even lowers its head. It lowers its head and it spreads its wings out. So likewise, when you're with your parents, you're supposed to lower your wings. And what kind of wings? Not your wings of pride, not your wings of arrogance. You should have wings of humility when you're with them. You should be kind, you should be humble. You shouldn't think, oh, now I am six. I'm, I'm a six-footer. I'm six-three. And uh, I'm a basketball player, I'm a football player, I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, I'm this, I'm that. 
I am now a cricketer, if you will, or I own a big house, I'm rich, I run around in an expensive car, I am so and so, I'm so and so now, I don't have to, you know, respect my parents, they live under me, they live in my house. No, we should always be kind to them, we should be loving to them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, and pray for them. Oh my Lord, have mercy upon both of them, just as how they looked after me when I was small. Your mother, she carried you for nine months. She underwent so much of pain, the stretch marks, whilst you were in her womb. You bit her, you kicked her. You did all of that. She carried you for nine months. She underwent labor, which is not something easy to give birth to you. And whilst you were young, whilst you were a baby, she looked after you, she cleaned you, she bathed you. You cried many a time. There were many sleepless nights. Whilst she used to uh, breastfeed you and give you milk. And now here we are. We are adults now. We can find our own food. We eat by ourselves. We don't technically need the help of our parents. But yet we should never ever forget our parents. We should keep praying for them. We should be in their service. At a time some of us have parents who are old and they are like children now. The, the older they become, they become like children. So think of how when you were a child, when you used to defecate, they would change your clothes. They would change your pampers if you will. They would never ever turn their nose and say, oh, I can't get, think of getting close to my child. No, they would come and do all of that for you. But now at times when we grow older, we don't want to get close to our parents. We tend to go and put our parents in hospitals, in elder uh, homes for elders and whatnot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, remember, whatever goes around always inevitably comes around. Let me tell you all of another story. A story that was narrated to me by a student of knowledge. And this story took place in the lands of Arabia. There was once a young man who had a mother and a father. Sadly, what happens, his mother passes away and now his father is left all alone. Father is an old man who is living in his own house. The young boy is married and he has a small child, uh, a boy. Now, after his mother passes away, he tries his level best. He lives in one city, his father lives in another city. He tries his level best to look after his father from where he is, but he finds it very difficult to do so because it's inconvenient. He has to travel on a daily basis. Every day in the morning before he heads off uh, for work, he has to go check on his father. And then in the evening, he has to check on his father. And the father is an old man all alone, so he's scared. So he thinks about it. He goes to his father and he suggests... Father, why don't you come and stay with me? Why don't you come and stay with me? It will make things a lot easier. It will be easier for me to look after you. So why don't you come and stay with me? The father says, no son, I don't want to come and burden you, burden your wife and your child in your home. Let me stay here. If you want, you get employ someone to look after me. The boy thinks about it and he thinks, what will society talk? And they will, you know, look down upon me. He tells his father, no, I have to take you back home. Please come. So somehow he persuades his father, his father packs his bags and the boy, the young man, takes his father home. He takes his father home and he puts his father up in a guest room, in an extra room in his house. Now that night there is a big feud, a big battle, if you will, between the man and his wife. The lady, she says, why didn't you discuss with me before bringing your father in here? I got married to you. And I didn't get married to look after your father and clean up after him. There's this big battle. Somehow the man was able to convince the lady and he said, don't worry, I'll make sure that there are servants to look after everything. You will not be troubled. And just as he, did, he said, so because he was a rich man, he was an engineer, a doctor, and he was being well paid. So he had a driver, he had servants to look after his father. But now the, the old man, because of his old age, he was finding it very difficult to, you know, relieve himself, even eat at the dining table. Whenever he would eat by the dining table, he would spill the food all over and he would make a mess because he was growing older. His hands were trembling and shivering due to old age. So each time the, 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 the old man made a mess, the lady would get angry and she would say, you're wasting the food, you're spilling the food, etc, etc. Until one day, it was the last straw for the, for the lady because whilst they were eating, she had laid out her expensive crockery, her expensive plateware. And the old man, while trying to serve the food, he dropped a couple of the plates and they smashed into smithereens on the ground. Now, 
the lady, she loses her top. She goes to her husband and says, look, this is the last straw. It's either your father in this house or I, me in the house. If you want your father, then I'm going out. The man contemplates and he thinks, no, I got to keep everything properly in place. And he goes to his father and says, look, dad, I thought things would work out by bringing you here, but looks like things have become worse. But I have this suggestion. I don't want you to go back to your city. I have some quarters outside of my house, okay, and this was the suggestion from his wife. He says, can you please go and stay there? Now those quarters were the driver's quarters. Those quarters were the driver's quarters, the maid's quarters, if you will. The father was heartbroken, but still he did not want to be a burden upon his child, as initially he had mentioned. He very sadly, very dejected, he packs up his bags and he says, son, I never wanted to be a burden upon you or your family. I will move to the driver's quarters. And he moves to the driver's quarters, a small room outside in the, uh, the, the, the compound of the house. And he starts to live his life there. Now, the lady, she was very happy that she had gotten rid of her father-in-law. But she felt it was her responsibility to send food. Now she started to think, if I send food and my expensive crockery, he's going to end up breaking all of my plates. So she purchases an, a, 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 a plastic plate, a plastic basic plate, and she puts all the food, no bowls or anything, just a plate. She puts all the food on the plate and has the maid take the food on that plate. Days pass by and because the plate was from, made of a cheap plastic, what started to happen is that plate started to deteriorate. It started to become very old and, you know, haggard looking. But this was the state. Every day, the maid would go take the food, keep it outside the dough of the driver's quarters, knock the dough and leave. The old man would take, he would eat whatever he could and leave the plate back again. Days pass by, the son completely forgets about his father because his father is living in the, out, in the compound of his house, the driver's quarters. Now one day, the maid goes to give the food. She has the plate in her hand. She goes and she places the plate by the dough only to notice that the dough was left ajar. It was a bit open. So she was surprised because in general, the dough would always be closed. So she pushes the dough just to have a peek inside to see whether everything was alright. The minute she opens the dough, she lets out a horrified scream. She screams, the old man has passed away, the old man has passed away because the old man, the father of that young man was sprawled on the ground, he had fallen dead. Now the minute she screamed, everybody in the house came running out. The young man also came running out because he heard her saying, the old man has passed away, the old man has died. And he thinks, my father has passed away. And he comes running. And this was the first time after having put his father out, he was visiting his father. He comes running to the room and he opens the door only to be met by a disgusting sight. Clothes were heaped all over the place. There was dirt in the place. Nobody had cleaned the room. There was food strewn here and there. And his father was in the middle fallen. And because the maid had come in and she was shocked, she had dropped the plate of food and the food had got, you know, strewn all over the place and the plate had been thrown into a corner. Now, whilst he was observing this and feeling so much of disgust, he immediately called the driver, called the maids and he wanted all of them to clean up the place quickly. His little son, comes running from inside because he too had heard the maid scream, the old man has died, the old man has died. The little boy comes running and he wriggles through his father's legs and makes his way into the room. The man does not notice the boy there. He is ordering the maids and the servants to clean up the place, get some garbage bags, clean up the place quickly, he is ordering them. And then he notices his son, the small boy, had ran to that plastic plate and he was holding the plastic plate and he was hugging the plastic plate. The man said, son, what are you doing? The plate is dirty. Leave it and come here. I want to tell these people to clean up the room. The boy says, no, no, Baba, I want the plate. No, dad, I want the plate. I want the plate. The man says, why do you want that dirty plastic plate? Come out, please come out. I want them to clean up the place. Come out. It's so dirty. The boy, say, the boy is adamant and he says, no, I want the plate. I want the plate. Finally, the father, he was so angry. He said, why do you want the plate? Why do you want the plate? The boy says, well, father, when you grow old, I have to serve you food on the same plate. I have to serve you food on the same plate. When you grow old, I'm keeping this plate to serve you food on the same plate. 
And that's when the father realized, and he was heartbroken. He realized what goes around inevitably comes around. If you treat your parents in a bad way, then be prepared. You treating them in a bad way could be a test for them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But remember, if that's how you treated your parents, then your children will treat you the same because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put you through a test as well. So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we have to be extremely careful when we deal with our parents. Because whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about ibadah, Allah affixes and adjoins treating our parents with excellence with that as well in the Quran. And so we have to be extremely careful that we don't break their hearts, that we do our level best to please them. Some of them at times want us to visit them often, we should visit them often. Sometimes they want us to call them often and speak to them often, we should do so. We should always be in touch with them. I mentioned yesterday that if you want your du'as to be answered, you have to be careful that you don't sever your family ties. And from all of the family ties, your relationship with your parents is the most important. If you do not speak to your father, if you do not speak to your mother, then your dua is not going to be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Use this month of Ramadan if things have gone sour with your parents to go patch up with them. Don't wait till it's too late. You and I, none of us here have a guarantee that we will walk out of the masjid doors. We don't have a guarantee. So don't wait till it's too late. Don't think, oh, you know what, after Ramadan, I'll go and patch up things with them. Or on the day of Eid, I'll go and patch up things with them. No. If things have gone sour, patch them up right now. Right now. As you leave the doors of the masjid, call them up and say, I'm coming to patch up things. I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, dad. Go home and patch up things with them. Don't wait till it's too late. Let me tell you all one final story and I'll wrap off, inshallah. There was another. This, this was when I was in London. There was a person who told me this story of uh, an engineer. He, when he was a young boy, his father used to come drop him off at school. His father used to come drop him off at school. And the father had a very bad skin disease. Something similar to elephantiasis, where his uh, hands and legs were swollen. There was this disease and he had a, a very bad rash. So, he, in a sense, he wasn't a pleasant sight to look. And he also had a bandage over one of his eyes. But he loved his son so much that he insisted that he should drop his child at school and he would come every single day to drop his child at school. That's this young man, the engineer. So now, as usual in school, you know how the kids are. They started to tease this boy about his father about how ugly his father looked and that his father looked like a pirate with only one eye. They started to tease this boy and this boy started to feel bad and he started to feel very ashamed of his father. And he would always try to convince his father, but he didn't want to hurt his father because he was a young boy. He would try to convince his father not to come drop him off at school because he did not want to be embarrassed. And as time passes, the boy grows up and still the man would insist to come and drop him off at school. And now as he was growing up, he did not want to be embarrassed by, uh, you know, uh, by his friends, you know, but he did not want to be embarrassed amidst his friends. He, wa he told his father off one day very sternly and harshly, look dad, I'm, I'm, I'm big enough now, I can go to school by myself, I don't need you to come and drop me off at school. And he was very harsh with his father. And whilst he was talking to his father, he felt bad because he could see tears flowing from his father's eyes because his father wanted to drop him off at school because he loved him so much. But then again, the father felt, if my son wants to be happy this way, then I'll stop coming to drop you off at school. And he tells his son, okay son, I won't come anymore. I won't come anymore. anymore. Now, what happens is the boy grows up, he goes to college and he enters university and now he's studying and his father wouldn't come visit him but his father would spend on him and he facilitated his education for him. He graduates and now he's an engineer. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm fast, forward, fast forwarding through the story. Now he's an engineer and he gets a job in the United States. He moves over there. He establishes himself. He gets married and now he's living a very good life. One day he goes to a particular function where he meets his family doctor in that function. Now he was an individual who had gone through a kidney transplant, the, the engineer. So when he meets the doctor, the doctor tells him, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see you because you were one of my patients and when we did the kidney transplant, I was very worried, I was very worried that sometimes due to uh, compatibility issues, your body might reject the kidney and that you might fall terribly ill because your situation was very bad. Your situation, you were on the brink of dying. 
But then Alhamdulillah, the match was perfect because after all, the kidney was from your father. The kidney was from your father. And he let this out. Now this boy did not know of it. He knew that he had gone through a kidney transplant, but he was not aware that he had received the kidney from his father. When the doctor said this, he couldn't believe his ears. He could not believe his ears. He said, my father donated his kidney for me. The doctor says, yes, and it's not only that. It's not only that. Did he not tell you about it? The boy said, no, I wasn't aware. The doctor then went on to say, when you were young after the kidney transplant due to compatibility issues, you, in a sense, your body was, um, you know, taking time to accept the kidney, you started to fail in your eyesight as well. One of your eyes. And your father donated one of his eye corneas. You can't transplant the entire eye. You can't transplant the entire eye. It's the cornea, the, 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 the lining in the front. He donated that as well. And I repeatedly asked him, are you sure that you want to do this? And he said, I want my son to be able to see the world with all its beautiful colors. And even if I have to sacrifice one of my eyes for that, I'm ready to do it. And he signed the document and he donated one of his eyes for you. The boy could not believe his ears. And then the doctor says, and finally after all of that, because he donated one of his kidneys to you, he started to suffer, his immune system started to weaken, and that's how he developed that skin disease that you are aware of, the disease that is similar to elephantiasis. The minute the boy heard that, he books the next flight out back to London to visit his father. He goes all the way to visit his father, and when he reaches his father's house, he finds the door locked and no one there. He's surprised. He knocks the door, knocks the door, no one's there. He goes to the neighbor's house only to find out that his father had passed away a few months back. They had tried to get in touch with him, but there had been no way of communicating him, communicating to him or communicating this message across to him. They could not reach out to him. The father had passed away. And the neighbor says, the lawyer's contact number has been given because your father has left certain documents for you to come and collect. The boy goes to the lawyer's office only to find out that the father had written the only piece of property that he had his house for his son. And he had also left a letter for his son apologizing and stating that he was sorry that he had come and embarrassed his son in school. But then he goes on to explain everything about how he had donated his kidney, how he had donated his eye, and how he had done all of that for the happiness of his son. He had done all of that for the happiness of his son. And he said, all I wanted for you, my dear son, is to be happy in this world. And this is all that I wanted. I never ever wanted to embarrass you. The boy, the minute he reads the letter, he's filled with tears, he's crying. And he runs to the grave of his father. But there's nothing that he can do now. It's too late. He was crying. And trust me, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, for those who have lost their parents, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless their parents with the highest stations in paradise, you go and ask them, each and every one of them would say, if they could go to the graves of their parents and take their parents out, if they could bring them back alive and hug them, kiss them and ask them for their forgiveness, each and every one of them would. So those of you who have your parents with you, if they are alive, you are extremely fortunate. So don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait till they pass away and then you go by their grave, fall by their grave and start crying there. There will be no point at that point. So make sure that you go patch up things with them now, right now, if things have gone bad. And make sure that you express your love to them. Make sure that you treat them well with excellence upon excellence before it's too late. With that I conclude, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our sins, to accept our good deeds. And just as how He unites us here, may He unite us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May He bless each and every one of our parents. May He bless all of our parents, the ones who are alive. May He bless them with long lives full of good health. And those whose parents who have passed away, may He bless them with high state in paradise. May he bless them with the best of both worlds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of us. And I look forward to talking to you all tomorrow. Same time inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. Ameen wa akhir da'wai. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.